This man was about to break out of prison. He ties his wrists with shoelaces and breaks his thumbs, which causes him to convulse in pain. Then he takes out a thin rope and ties one into a vial of medicine and the other to his teeth. He swallowed the vial. Finally, he took out a lighter and hid the flint under his fingernail. He tried it out and saw that the sparks were perfect. It's all very strange and confusing. How is he going to break out of prison? Peter is a vicious murderer, although he only has a junior high school education. He has an IQ of 150. Not only did he kill several people, he also buried many hostages alive during his escape. After being caught, he was sentenced to life in prison. But even though he was in prison, he still aspired to a faraway place. He kept on learning every day and pushed himself to work out. When we see his muscles, we know he's not to be messed with. He always believed that there must be a chance for him to escape. Sure enough, his self-discipline touched God, and the chance finally came. One day, an officer named Frank came to the prison to ask for help. His son had blood cancer and needed a bone marrow transplant to survive. But Peter was the only bone marrow match in the country. At first, Peter turned the officers down. But soon after, he reached out to Frank and agreed to donate the bone marrow because he wanted to atone for his past sins. Peter made a few more offers to Frank. The first was that he be allowed to smoke. The second was that he be allowed to use the prison library. These requests were not much to ask, so Frank immediately promised to do his best to meet his demands. In fact, Frank's had some bad luck in recent years. His wife died in a car accident, and soon after his son got blood cancer, his colleagues were very sympathetic to him. The chief even asked the governor's aide to help him press the warden to fulfill Peter's conditions as soon as possible. Sure enough, the guards soon brought Peter cigarettes. But even with the cigarettes, Peter didn't seem to be enjoying himself because all this was just an illusion to confuse the police. The moment he met Frank, he hatched a new plan to escape. After the guards left, he took off his shoelaces and tied his wrists, then put his fingers on the table and broke his thumbs by stepping on the shoelaces. Although his whole body was convulsing with pain, he forced himself to endure the pain without making a sound. He went to the prison library and found a diagram of the hospital. He downloaded it when the police weren't looking. After studying the structure of the hospital, he got a bottle of anesthetics through someone in the prison. He tied a string around the bottle and the other end around his teeth and swallowed the bottle into his stomach. Finally, he took out a lighter, took out the flint inside and put it under his fingernail. When everything was ready, the police escorted him to the hospital for the transplant. Why did Peter know in advance which hospital the operation would take place? Because this hospital is the designated partner of the prison. All patients needing surgery will be sent to this hospital. There's an old building across the street that's a temporary prison. Prisoners will be pressed into this temporary prison after surgery. There's a bridge connecting the hospital and the building. In order to prevent Peter from escaping, the warden himself came to help and a large number of armed forces were deployed. The police escorted Peter to the entrance of the hospital. Two police dogs greeted him. Peter's hostility scared the dogs away. The chief was there to supervise the operation, but the doctor said they had to extract bone marrow from Peter's tailbone, and they couldn't operate if his hands were cuffed behind his back. The chief agreed to release the handcuffs and tied his hands to the operating table. By this time, Peter had secretly chewed through the bottle and twisted his fingers to dislocate his thumb. When the doctor gave him the anesthetic, Peter closed his eyes with great cooperation, but the doctor soon realized something was wrong. The anesthetic had been used at maximum dosage, but Peter didn't lose consciousness. While the doctors were still puzzled, Peter's hands broke free from the restraints. He suddenly leapt up and kicked the chief out of the way, quickly rolled out of bed and pulled out the trachea. He then makes a flamethrower by igniting the gas with a flint hidden in a holder. A doctor is soon covered in flames and screams in terror. The operating theater was in chaos, and Peter escaped. He jumps into the hospital's laundry chute and grabs the pacemakers and slides into the underground laundry room. Frank rushes downstairs to catch up, but when he arrives he finds the laundry room empty, with only blood on the chute. He's a criminal with a high IQ. It turned out that Peter climbed back down the chute and put on a lab coat to disguise himself as a doctor and walked around the hospital. He went to the laser room of the hospital and coerced a male doctor to use a laser gun to burn off the shackles on his feet. Then he operated on himself to remove the shrapnel from his thigh, and he used a needle to close the wound without anesthesia. Peter is really no ordinary man, and his escape plan has just begun. He soon sneaked into the ward and took a female doctor hostage, but Frank just happened to bump into him. He began to play psychological tactics again. He told Frank that a dead man's bone marrow is useless. If he died, his son wouldn't be saved. Frank was convinced and threw his gun on the ground. Peter had just picked up the gun when a cop spotted him. Frank, however, stood in front of the policeman to protect Peter and asked him not to shoot him. At that moment, there was the sound of a walkie-talkie. There was a cop hiding behind the curtains. Peter shot the cop in the head. He quickly turned around and shot the policeman behind Frank. Suddenly killed two colleagues. Frank did not know what to do, can only watch Peter escaped. At that moment, the chief also came over and was very angry at what he saw. He angrily asked Frank, how many more people do you want to die because of your son? 
he dismissed Frank on the spot. After going downstairs, Frank deliberately said that the police let the criminals go and attracted all the reporters around him. Then, he suddenly knocked over the policeman next to him and grabbed a motorbike and escaped. At that moment, Frank's assistant and the doctor were taking care of Frank's son in his hospital room. The assistant received a call from Frank saying that he would try to get him back to the hospital, but then Peter appeared from behind and knocked him to the ground without even trying. Hearing this, Frank rushed to the hospital with his motorbike. It turned out that Peter was looking for a gas called cyclopropane. This gas is the most powerful anesthetic gas, but it's also a flammable gas that can explode easily. The doctor took him to the room where the cyclopropane was stored, but when she was in the middle of getting the canister, she suddenly hit him on the head and then on his wound. Peter was on the floor, screaming in pain. The doctor quickly picked up his pistol and fled, but Peter didn't go after her because he had more important things to do. He went to the hospital's motor room and sprayed cyclopropane all over the room, ready to blow up the place and black out the whole building. And that's when Frank came after him, knowing Frank wouldn't dare shoot him. He ran into the room. When he came out, he had a lit cigarette in his hand. Without saying a word, he threw the cigarette butt into the room and the motor room was blown to smithereens. The power went out and the hospital was plunged into darkness. Due to the blackout, the sterile ward where Frank's son was staying couldn't work. So an aide pushed him across the street to the sterile ward in the temporary prison. But Peter climbed over the roof of the catwalk and put a beacon of cyclopropane on top of it and used his clothes to climb over the barbed wire. Then he started to smash the glass windows on the doors. He was soon spotted by the police on the court fee. The police shone a searchlight on him and shot him wildly. But Frank, who was upstairs, did the trick again. He was afraid that the police would kill Peter and shot out the searchlight. Peter got a moment's respite and finally opened the door and escaped into the temporary prison. The warden in the temporary prison was controlled by Peter when he got the news. He held a syringe in his hand and told the warden that it was sulfuric acid. The warden was too scared to move. In fact, the syringe was not acid at all, but morphine for pain relief. Peter escorted the warden all the way to the main control room of the temporary prison. When the guards saw this, they all fell to the ground. The other inmates were all excited to see such a powerful Peter. Tapping on the windows, he went to the control room and closed all the entrances to the temporary prison. Then he used the microphone to order all the guards to come to the control room or he would kill all the hostages. He was as arrogant as a king. Then he contacted the chief outside and asked him to prepare a helicopter for him in 15 minutes or he would kill a hostage every minute. And then he saw Frank climbing the fence on the court V. But Peter used his computer to operate the fence and block the only entrance. Frank gets on the walkie-talkie and tells Peter that he knows everything about the police deployment outside and that he can help him get out. He told Peter to open the door and let him in. Peter thinks about how many times this guy has helped him and how much he admires his dedication to saving his son. So we opened the door and let him in. The chief thought Frank had betrayed him. So he led a large group of men to force their way in. But Peter had taken precautions because he had placed a large canister of cyclopropane on top of the overpass. The police force slowly approached the bridge, while Peter had already set up a sniper rifle on the upper floors. When Frank realizes what Peter is trying to do, he gets on the walkie-talkie and calls the chief to tell them to stop. The chief doesn't believe him anymore and switches off the radio to continue. Frank fired several shots at the bridge in a hurry. The police dared not go any further and retreated. Then Frank shot the cyclopropane again. The huge explosion blew the bridge into two pieces. At that moment, the chief realized that without Frank's help, all of them would have been killed. Peter was furious that the plan had been ruined and was ready to go after Frank. Frank is outside his son's sterile ward. The men were no match for Peter, and he soon had them all under his gun. He takes Frank's son and uses him as a shield, then locks Frank and the others in the sterile ward. Once again, Frank watched Peter escape, and that's when the helicopter arrived. Peter handcuffed all the guards and the warden and escorted them to the balcony. But instead of taking the helicopter, he locked the guards and the helicopter outside the balcony. The snipers ambushed not far from the helicopter didn't understand why Peter did that. It turns out that the helicopter was also a cover for him to confuse the police. He knew that if he got into the helicopter, he'd be a target for the snipers. The cunning Peter would never make such a stupid mistake. He took Frank's son to the morgue and pushed open a cabinet. Then he grabbed an axe and smashed the wall. It turns out Peter's real goal was to dig a hole in the wall to get out. He'd studied the structure of this place before and knew where the walls were weakest. And all those years of working out every day finally came in handy. The wall soon had a gaping hole in it. He escaped through the gap into the sewer and then through a manhole cover. Frank was in hot pursuit. When he climbed out of the manhole, Peter was nowhere to be found. He realized Peter had taken his car when he found a man lying on the ground nearby. Frank tricked the cop next to him into giving him his id to use the car's radio. But when Frank got the id, he drove the cop's car away. Then he used the cop's id to turn on the car's police radio to report Peter's escape to the chief. By this time, Peter was already a long way away. He's singing a little song with a cigarette in his mouth, and he couldn't be happier. But Peter's blue pickup truck was spotted by a roadside cop. He reported it over the walkie-talkie. 
and Frank knew where Peter was headed through the police car's communications equipment. He chased Peter's blue pickup in his police car and finally found it. He followed Peter all the way. When he passed a sign for a railway bridge, he had an idea and deliberately drove into Peter's car, forcing him onto a turnoff at the railway bridge. Peter thought he'd lost him. In fact, Frank was a tough guy. He flew off the road and caught up with Peter. Peter was chased onto the railway bridge, and Frank used his walkie-talkie, posing as the chief, to ask the superintendent to raise the bridge's iron pillars. Peter's car was soon stopped and he got out again to escape, but Frank didn't panic and posed as the chief to ask the caretaker to raise the bridge. As the bridge rose higher and higher into the air, Peter had no way out. At that moment, the chief arrived in a helicopter. Peter shoots at the helicopter and it starts to smoke. The police on the plane fired back, but Frank blocked the bullets with his body for Peter. Peter tried to jump off the bridge again. In the heat of the moment, Frank shot Peter in the leg. Peter lost his center of gravity and fell, followed by Frank. Soon after, the dying Peter was rescued from the lake by Frank. Frank thought he was dying and carried him to the hospital. The chief was touched by Frank's persistence and let Frank go. After arriving at the hospital, the doctors harvested Peter's bone marrow and operated on Frank's son. Frank was relieved to see his son back to health, but Peter looked very weak, as if he was about to die. He seemed to be whispering his last words. A nearby policeman goes over to listen and soon realizes that he's been tricked by Peter again. What kind of car do you have? It seems that his escape plan has just begun. This film is called Desperate Measures, released in 1998. After watching this film, I realized that breaking out of prison is not an easy task. You need to have expertise in all aspects of computers, biochemistry, physics, and most importantly, a strong body. But Frank, the policeman in the film, has attracted a lot of controversy because he helped criminals escape many times to save his son and got his colleagues killed. As a father he is great, but as a cop he is negligent in his duty. If you were this policeman, what would you do? May excellent movies be watched by more people. You can subscribe to Chili Film and leave comments.